Welcome to For the Long Run, the podcast exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long, strong, and motivated. I'm your host, Jonathan Levitt. Through personal and professional connections in the running world, I have the privilege of getting to know some amazing athletes. I've always been fascinated by the psychological aspect of running, and this podcast is aimed at exploring this and much more. I hope you enjoy. Welcome back. I have Marty Heher, Heher on the podcast today. I, wow, I screwed that up and we just went over it. <laughs> um, well, anyway, Marty, thanks so much for uh, for taking some time to chat today. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. And you were plenty close enough on the name. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, first question, who is Marty? Oh, gosh. Who, like, that's a deep question. Like, I don't know how <laughs> we want to go there. Marty, Marty is, was originally my dad, first of all. My dad's also a Martin, but he's been a Marty his, his whole life. Um, I only adopted Marty because I think everyone started calling me that once, uh, basically in college. And then, in, and then it just kind of became, uh, who I was in the running world. So, um, but I mean, I'm, I'm a lot of things. I, I, I don't know. I maybe might wait for some follow-up questions after <laughs> before I dive in. <laughs> awesome. Maybe, maybe we'll start on the running side of things since this is mostly a running podcast after all. Um, so we'll, so let's, let's set the stage there. Um, do you remember your first run? So, yeah, like the, the first thing I really remember as far as running goes Oh, well, actually, you just made me think of going even further back. I would say my first like real run that I remember goes back to fourth grade Um, because at our elementary school, there was a pumpkin run every year. And it was basically like a lap around like the playground and soccer fields. I think it really it wasn't even a mile. It was maybe like three quarters of a mile. Um, And I remember like getting, I think, maybe fourth or fifth place because it was also with the fifth graders. So I was like fourth and I was the first fourth grader. And now, you know, so that, yeah, that was kind of like my, my first experience. And I didn't win a pumpkin that year, but then I won a pumpkin the following year as a fifth grader. And then that was, you know, that, that's my first memory of running. <laughs> and at, at what point did you realize that, um, so it sounded like you, you did quite well in that first one, maybe not, you know, the top of the podium, but, um, when did you realize you were, you were pretty good at this, uh, this running thing? That, that took a little longer. Um, I think like the pumpkin run. And then I remember like a year or two later, we ran like our town's 5k, me and my siblings. And that, that was a lot of fun. Just like totally beating my mom's expectations of like how fast she thought we, we would run. Um, but I didn't really realize I was pretty good at it until I guess like seventh grade. Um, because at that point in seventh grade, you know, high school for us starts ninth grade. Um, but at that point I was good enough. I was like trying to make the varsity team. I, I didn't do it in seventh grade, but I did in eighth grade. But I knew the fact that I was like trying out for the varsity team must have meant I was pretty good at it. <laughs> That is, that is a good indicator. Um, so, so in between that, you know, the elementary school and high school, um, what did running look like for you? I mean, it was, there was really no serious, I guess, no element. I'm, I'm sorry. In middle school, it was just like learning from the older kids. Cause I was just the seventh or eighth grader. I mean, even in sixth grade too, but I don't even think we really did anything that year because um, I was playing all the other sports as well. So the running was more just something I did on the side all, all, almost, except again, as I was maybe 12 or 13 towards the end of middle school is when um, I was doing you know indoor track, outdoor track and cross country. So it, I, I was already kind of fully immersed in it, even though I was still doing soccer very seriously as well. Um so it was just something I really enjoyed doing because I loved like all my teammates and like, you know, I, I had a ton of friends and it was really fun learning and getting to hang out with all the older kids. Cause you know, as a, you know, I got to hang out with high school, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. So that was like, you know, really exciting for a little 12 or 13 year old kid. I can only imagine. So uh, fast forward till uh, to today, um, you tweeted the other day, the simple refusal of accepting where you are, is how you get to where you want to be. Everyone is on the verge of a breakthrough. You just need to be, need to stubbornly persevere until that moment arrives. You're in a marathon at a 4:55 pace. Um, 
that's that's fast. Uh, that's that's objectively fast, no matter who you are. Um, how? So I'm I'm really interested in that um, refusal of accepting where you are and that you're not at your limits at the moment. Um, where did that Where did that attitude or where did that um, mindset come from? It's a good question. Um, I feel like maybe that was the first time I put it in such a, in such a well formatted sentence, but, um, I feel like I've kind of had that attitude for a long time. Um, because I think the sport of running is very much geared towards that mentality of, you know, the classic, like keep working hard, keep grinding, and you're going to get to where you want to be. Um, as long as you're consistent and don't give up. Um, and you know, maybe I wasn't actually thinking like that in middle school and high school, but I was thinking like, I want to get better. I want to run PRs. I want to, you know, see how good I can be. So, and I knew that that kind of meant not getting comfortable and, you know, not like being lazy and, um, you know, and, and doing what we needed to do in, in practice and on the weekends, like, you know, we didn't have any high school practice on the weekends. So that was when we like had to meet up on our own, do a long run and that, you know, and so, I think, you know, that's kind of been something in the back of my mind that's been part of my like internal drive and motivation to want to keep doing it is because you really can't just accept where you're, where you're at if you want to get, if you want to get better. Definitely. I love that. Um, I saw a tweet from Brad Stolberg the other day, um, basically, uh, his, his recipe for success in, in eight simple steps. And (laughs) step two was essentially process over outcome. And so I've done, I don't know, this will be episode 140 or something. And so I've, I've spoken with over hundred professional elite and elite athletes. And what comes up over and over and over again is, is this, it's the, like, I just want to be better. I want to figure out how good I can be versus I want to run a 208 marathon or I want to run a 207 marathon or I want to win a race. It's, it, it's been really interesting to hear almost nobody say any sort of tangible this is what i want to achieve it's just the the intangible of like i just want to get better yeah that's that's a very that's very well put because that is i feel like a very common theme and i've never been one i kind of thought i was more of an outlier in being someone who never liked to set very hard like clear goals like yeah i want to run this time by this point in my life or something like that I've never really thought like that. It's always been, like you said, like more process oriented, like I'm going to get a little better each and every day and I'm going to train as hard as I can for this upcoming marathon and the shape I get in is the shape I get in and we'll see what happens. Um, so yeah, that's, that's always been my mentality as well. What does success mean to you along the same lines? Oh, that's a good question as well. Um, success is just, um, so I don't want to say like success, you know, I, I feel like you never really hit like an end mark. There never is like any one point where you say this is success and this isn't. I think um, for me, success is kind of like what we were just talking about. Just being happy in the active pursuit of trying to get better. Um, and, you know, so for me, success is putting together another ch- another consistent, healthy training block and getting a chance to perform and see how, you know, how far I can get and how fast I can, I can do it. Um, so I think, yeah, again, it's, it's more of the journey, more of the process that's success for me versus, um, any one like race or outcome. Very cool. I like that. Um, I like that approach and I like that answer. Um, onto something that most would objectively consider a success. You recently won the marathon project, um, and ran a, a 208, 59, 58, something, nine, something very quick. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm curious first, what was, what was the experience like racing in 2020? We'll start there. Um, You know, it was, it was unique in the whole, I mean, obviously it was different with all the COVID protocols that needed to happen. Um, and the race itself was small. There wasn't that many people there, but, but like ultimately though, like when we got 
on the start line, like it was no different. And the race itself was no different than any other race. Like I didn't think anything different. I wasn't like, there was no other thoughts or weird things that change as far as like just the beauty of being in a race, being in a competition and just kind of forgetting about it, everything else. Like that was still just as awesome as it always was. I think it's, it's just the whole, the process of getting to the race was different um, as far as COVID tests goes and, some zoom calls instead of getting all the athletes in one room. And, um, but it, you know, it really wasn't drastically different. It was, it was just really cool after such a long hiatus of not being able to do that, that I think, um, we didn't think twice about kind of j- jumping through a few extra hoops to, to get that experience. For sure. What was it like, um, in the last couple miles, you were neck and neck with, uh, with Noah Drotti there for a bit. Um, where does your head go when you're, deep in the pain cave and you still have, you you know, you're, you have a competitor on your, on your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say like 5k to go, I knew it was going to get hard pretty soon. And I knew I had kind of started to put maybe like a five to 10 second gap on Noah. Um, And then pretty much, like you said, like, like two miles to go was where it was like full pain cave. Like, you know, I didn't slow down drastically but it felt awful it felt the 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 effort like skyrocketed for just maintaining whatever pace and trying not to just fall um so where 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 did my head go i don't know you kind of get frantic but at the same time you just accept like i just accept like you I'm frantic in the sense of like all right i hope he's not going to catch me i'm doing everything i can but then there's also a mix of just pure acceptance of, well, I, I, I knew I was going to make it to the finish line. I was like, I, you know, I'm not going to just like blow up and start running eight minute pace. Um, so I did take a little solace in that and knowing that I'm going to get to the finish line as fast as I can. And, you know, right now all I was focused or in that moment, I was just focused on milking my body and legs for whatever they were worth and just going to be content with, with that being enough. Um, there wasn't really anything else going through my head besides yeah, trying not to get caught and really wanting to win the race. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, I, personally, those are the moments that, that I live for. Like I, I love that feeling. Um, I trained for four years to try and break three. And in my, I don't know, fifth attempt at trying to do it. Um, I started to slow down at 18. I sped up a little bit and then I started to slow down at, like 22, 23. And I made that conscious decision at 23, like, all right, sub seven pace from here on out. Uh, don't screw up now. And this is going to hurt a lot. And it's that like, it's that test or it's that moment where it's so unknown and you just don't know what's going to happen next. Um, I was talking to Shalane Flanagan before, before that race. And she said, that's where she feels most alive in that, in that, pivot point or in that moment when you really don't know what's going to happen next, but it's really freaking exciting to, to keep churning and, and see what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it's particularly exciting when it pans out for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but even when it doesn't, it's, it's cool too. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, I mean, there's always like a takeaway. There's always something to be learned from those moments. Um, I, yeah, I think I take a little less poetic, like, love of that feeling and i'm more like i think about that more in training to be honest um when we're going through like our some of our harder workouts in a training segment um those are the times when i'm really like embracing the the ends of those workouts when it's getting really hard and i'm like actively telling myself this is what the race like this is the race this is this is like the marathon. This is the feeling that you're going to have to deal with at some point and get through. So that, that, that's a, so I kind of use that feeling more as a training tool than something that I like look forward to. Um, yeah. and that way in, in the race, yeah, it's, it, it's something that I expect. It's something that, I you know, I've dealt with multiple times in, in the, the whole, you know, the three months leading up to that race. And because of that, like, I, I mean, I don't shy away from it. I definitely agree with you in the sense of like, it is a cool place to be and knowing that, you know, as just competitive people, competitive athletes, like we feel way more comfortable and alive in that moment than 99% of the population. So that's a pretty cool, 
cool place to be. Um, so I definitely agree with you there. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Um, the what you said there about like you get to that hurt locker in in training so that the race is um, I don't want to say easier because it's not, but you're preparing in in the training, right? Right. Right. Which is, that's what training is, right? You want to like mimic and imitate the race as much as possible. For sure. Do you do any mental training? Nah. <laughs> um, Just ha- having a couple of kids and working the, working the job that you work uh, enough, <laughs> enough for yeah, mental training. Yeah, I feel like my brain gets stimulated more than enough <laughs> studying medicine and just juggling of life that I have no, I mean, maybe I'd be someone who would benefit from like sitting down for 10 minutes a day and doing all like the headspace and meditation stuff. But uh, it's, um, I don't know. It's never really been my, uh, my cup of tea. So let's, let's talk about that. You've got quite a lot going on and you manage to run really fast and train really hard. How do you, how do you balance all of that? Yeah, that's, it's, I mean, I've gotten this question a few times now and I still don't have like a fantastic answer. I think for one, you, it's not like it all just happened at once, right? It's not like I got dumped two kids, got thrown into like medical school and like have been, you know, then had to train for a marathon all at the same time. Like these are all things that have gradually incorporated themselves into my life. Um, you know, I was a professional runner first, I guess. And then, um, then, you know, and as well as, and training, in even in college as as a student athlete i think that's almost you get the twofold of school and being an athlete and then um but then i was just running and then you know me and my wife monica we got married and um you know pretty soon after our first daughter mckenna was born um and around that time is when i started training for my first marathon um and uh, i guess before mckenna was born i had started school so now you know so these things are all staggered by like a year which was i think helpful in the whole process of just absorbing that change of lifestyle um, and just fitting it in. Um, And then, but to be a little more concrete um, as far as like balancing, it's just, um, it's a, you have to have a, I mean, I have an amazing support system obviously with my wife and um, both of sets of our parents. And, you know, if we ever need help with anything, like we always have someone to lean on um, in that department. And then, and then it's just like, there's always enough time in a day to do the things you're passionate about and you want to do. I'm a firm believer that, you know, it's just, it's just a matter of prioritizing things. I mean, we all, I think everyone gets our daily screen time at the end of the week on our iPhones and, you know, everyone's like aghast when they see they spend like an hour and a half to two and a half hours a day on the phone, um, you know, right there. And I still get those numbers. So it's like, you know, there's enough time in the day for people to do things they want. It's more just whether the motivation is there to make it happen. Um, and for me, like I find that time usually just in the morning, um, get up early while everyone else is still asleep, get my, the bulk of my training and hard stuff in. Um, and then I can go and go about my day and get everything else done. Um, so it's really not anything super special or unique. Um, I think it's just kind of being a little more disciplined and, um, and that's that's it (laughs) yeah i I liked what you said at the beginning of your answer in particular where where you said like not this all didn't get dumped on me all at once it was it was gradual it was um you know added one at a time or a year at a time or whatnot i think it's it's the same way you get fit right it's like one day at a time it's one workout at a time it's the same way you do anything successfully just bit by bit chunk by chunk um i think that a lot of people sort of often get overwhelmed with well, there's so much going on and it's like no if you just take one bite out of it yeah. it's much easier to um to maintain right no i think that that's actually a, like a perfect analogy and for the whole running thing it's like yeah like if you if you just start training you just took two weeks off you didn't run a step and you think about some of those workouts you, you you're gonna have to do to be in your peak shape like you, you i like I couldn't be further away right now from any of the long runs I was doing leading up to this marathon. And it's uh, like, they're unfathomable to me now, but we all get there eventually. And it's just, you know, you just got to slowly chip, 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 chip away. Yeah. I think uh, it's a good point. Like I still can't fathom the marathon that I ran last spring 
but I'm I'm also not in marathon shape right now. I'm not marathon training, so of course I can't. <laughs> of course I can't fathom it. Um, it's an interesting point there. Um, one of the articles I read um, in Podium Runner about your race um, had a particularly interesting quote. Um, it was talking about your buildup, and um, it said that your coach aims to get you 95% fit so you don't burn out before even getting to the start. Our easy Sunday runs are just 40 minutes, mm-hmm. and they embody that mentality. So your your Sunday runs are, I'm guessing, after a Saturday long run? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we usually and- do Friday workout and Saturday long run. And so it's 40 minutes, a few miles, and then, um, like, how do you, how do you approach that day versus the other days of the week? Oh, that, I mean, Sundays are the best day of the week. That's how we did it. So, you know, my coach now, the coach of the Reebok group is also, was my college coach. Um, so we've, we've been on the same sort of, um, just training cycle for a long time now. And like Sundays are the best day of the week. It's like a total reset day. You run once you run, even 40 minutes might be, I I definitely had some days where I just went for like a four mile jog. Um, because it's really, that's the purpose of the day is to really just do whatever you want and relax. Um, it's nice. We don't, you know, we never have to meet up or anything. It's just like, go do, go, go for a jog. Um, it's, it's just a good day. It really is a reset day. It's like, let's just soak in all the hard work you did all week. Um, you know, you don't have another run to do, so you can have plenty of time to eat some extra food if you're, if you're, if you want, um, you know, just, and just kick your feet up and relax all day. And that's exactly kind of what it feels like both physically and mentally. Um, and that's, that's what it does. And then you start on Monday and it just feels like you're just reset. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I have, I have a, uh, four mile run in my, in my weekly schedule that feels like that too. It's like, you can do it at any point in the day. It's nice and easy and, um, saves a little, saves a little time in the morning. Right. It, it's a perfectly st- stress-free day. You know, you can get that 30 minutes in at any point and it's not gonna, it's not gonna cause you any, any damage or stress. <laughs> exactly. Um, talk to me about the, the meaning of die first, then quit. It's a, a slogan you've, uh, or it's a motto you've, you've shared in the past. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. That one really stuck out of nowhere. And I, I, I came across that, um, probably early in the year, like early in 2020. And I really, I didn't I mean, I liked it. I'm, I'm one to like pick out nice, fun quotes and inspirational quotes and like tape them to like a, a mirror or something. That one actually is on a post-it on the back of my phone, like inside the uh, case. So that's a good one. And I really like, I mean, it's, it's a little extreme for sure. Um, but I like the message it conveys, which is, I mean, you know, die first and quit, AKA quitting isn't really an option. And I take that to just mean like, you know, whatever you have to do, whatever job needs to get done, like you, you go and do it. And then that's it. Like there's no, there's truly no other option. So when you have that mentality and you take away the, the wishy-washiness and the mental strain that comes with like building yourself up to go do what you need to do because it's uncomfortable. You don't want to, there's not enough time. Blah, blah, blah. Like if you just take all that out, if, if your other option is to die, I guess, then, you know, you don't even have to think about it. It's going to get done and it's going to get done quickly, efficiently. And, uh, and then you just move on with your day. Um, <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's kind of what it means to me. <laughs> were, you, were you thinking about that at the end of the race? <sighs> no, no, I, I mean, I, I told you what I was thinking about. At that point, it was like I wasn't going to quit, but no, I didn't actively think of that quote. I wish I heard someone say it. I would have been. I heard on the the broadcast. Uh, yeah, Des was talking about it. Yes. So afterwards, I was like, man, I wish someone said that to me and like a mile ago. Um, but no, at that point, like I knew I wasn't going to quit, so I didn't have to think about that. <laughs> That's funny. Um, was there was there any sort of post race blues or or letdown after the race? Or after, you know, maybe a couple of days? Nope. <laughs> no. And it's been great. I mean, it was like a perfectly timed thing too, right? Like the race happened right before like Christmas and the holidays. Um, so it was like super nice. And I had I had I've had two weeks off from from school. So it's been like a perfect 
segue into just like soaking everything in, saying yes to all the interviews and podcasts, uh, um, and you know, just kind of so soaking in the the whole moment. Um, so no, no real letdown at all. I think if if anything, it's the opposite. It's just got me really excited um, just about the future and kind of and what could be next. Very cool. Um, I was going to say, what do you think 2021 will look like? But I guess we're in, tw- we're in 2021, so we can see what it looks like. But um, where, where are you focusing? Are you, are you dropping down to the 10 K? Is that, is that going to be the, the focus for the next few months? Yep. Yep. You, you got it. Um, you know, there's really no marathons until probably the fall at the earliest anyways. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm just like a lot of guys and girls in this sport and, the ultimate dream is making it an, an Olympic team. So I will, I will not ever pass up an opportunity to try to do so. So we've got, uh, you know, I was seventh in the Olympic trials, 10 K in 2016. So I would, uh, I'm really excited to kind of hunker down, get back into track shape. And, um, I know I can run a lot faster than I have. And now that I've got a mountain of marathon fitness under my legs, I'm just going to go and take, take a shot. Very cool. How does the training differ in the marathon versus the 10k and in um what it looks like for you? Um you know what's what's really nice is the coach fox system is just so strength based that it's not going to be drastically different. Um we're, we're I mean we're we're definitely going to not run as many miles, which is wonderful. Um you know, I was running 110, 115 for the marathon. I imagine somewhere between 85 to 100 kind of d- d- depending on where where we're at in the segment um will be more than enough and then still going to keep just a hearty dose of like our longer tempos and our longer farlick runs and some good hard long runs um i think it's just going to be swapping a few of those workouts for some actual track sessions um and getting comfortable running you know 420 pace again because it's definitely been a while (laughs) (laughs) um very cool what's What's the most, um, what's the piece about, uh, about running that excites you the most? I would say the, it, it really is the, the thought, like, you know, it's, it's a long term. it's like a delayed gratification process, right? We do all this training, we train really hard for, you know, at the end of the season for whatever goal race or, um, so for, for, for me, the most exciting part is, I mean, part of it is getting into shape um, and seeing like the progress I make along the way. Um, Like, for example, my first workout in this marathon segment for this past was I was brutally out of shape. Like I had my my second daughter was born in July. I like didn't run all summer because there was nothing to even train for. So like my first workout back like three and a half months before the race was um, like it was supposed to be, I think, 25 minute tempo and i could only do that i did tw- i called i did actually call it quits so there you go um at like 20 minutes i ran like 20 minutes at like i don't know 520 pace um and like i just couldn't have been further from thinking about 455 miles for a marathon um but i was still excited because i was like man this is a brutal starting point but it's a starting point and i know it's going to get better e- each and every week. And so I guess the whole training process is fun. I do enjoy seeing the progress um, because sometimes you can literally see it week from week, which is cool. Um, yeah. I think that that sort of like leveling up is um, yeah. one, of my, one of my favorite parts about it. It's like the things that used to be hard are now moderate or, or now even easy. And, and the more um, weeks and blocks you stack on top of each other like that, you know, the, the better, the faster, the easier it all gets. Yeah, no, that that's so, yeah, you said it even more succinctly than I did. That's, it's, that's, it's an extremely satisfying part of the whole, the whole running thing. But I would say like the ultimate, the reason I run is because I just, I love getting on the start line on, on race day. And I, I mean, I love being competitive with myself and, and with other people. Like I love to win. I love, so I love to beat everyone else, but I also love, to try to better myself and, you know, get closer and closer to whatever my potential might be. And fortunately we're in a sport where that's, it's, it's black, black and white. You go and you, you run a time. And if it's faster than what you ran before, then that's, you know, I, I definitely, I live for that. (laughs) What are you, what are you thinking about on that start line? 
on the start line, uh, not really too much. Usually just not doing anything dumb as far as like race plan goes, particularly in a, in a marathon, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking about, all right, we got the, um, this one was really simple because there was pacers. So there was really no real worry about going out too hard. Um, you know, I was thinking about the fluid stations and getting my gels in and, um, just kind of keying off and seeing, you know, just, I mean, I was, it's more just imagining like how the race is going to go. Not that I really care how it goes. Um, but just, you know, having played through a few scenarios in your head makes it a little easier. Um, when it, you know, when, when one of them eventually happens is, so is visualization something that you practice? Um, a little bit, not, I, I, again, like I don't get in my head very often, but I, but what I just said definitely sounds like visualization. So I would say yes, like, like a little bit, I think about like more about my own race and how I, how I want it to go and, um, how it would look in I, in an ideal world. But, but I do kind of pride myself in also knowing and expecting that like, it never goes how you want it to go. Right. So it's almost like I spent, I also spent a good deal of time just trying to like not like clear my mind and expect anything and not and not like get worked up or set on any one thing that makes sense um switching gears uh quite a bit uh let's talk about your medical career and background um where did the interest in um in that uh field come from I would say primarily like growing up from my mom, who's a pediatric nurse. Um, so she's been a nurse, you know, obviously ever since I was born. Um, and then it's funny, my whole, the whole, my whole family is like a dynasty of nurses. My, my twin sisters are nurses. All of my aunts, like all six of them are nurses. Um, my wife's a nurse practitioner. Um, even like some of the like cousins who've married into the family are, are nurses. Like it, it, it's almost com- comical so like there's always been that um you know just that influence and that sort of talk around the house growing up and i and very early on like i just found my interest in biology first it was biology and all things science and then we started doing human biology and physiology and such and then i just i really loved it um and i just knew it it, it really was never like this huge big decision i just kind of knew like oh man being a doctor and everything that you need to learn to become a doctor are all the things I'm going to love to learn about. So um, made that decision pretty early on, maybe like eighth or ninth grade, and uh, which has really made my life pretty easy as far as you know, picking a career. Where you were headed. I never had to like think about what am I going to do with my life? Yeah. Uh, that's always been it. That's awesome. Uh, talking about 2020 in that um, and your experience with everything that's been going on. Yeah. I mean, it's been, it's definitely been a, a hectic year. I mean, as, as a medical student, um, you know, we, I feel like it was pretty blanket across the country, but definitely here in Philly, all the students kind of got converted to online for roughly three months, kind of right, you know, April, May, no, I, 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 end of March, April, May. Yeah. So, so somewhere in, in that time we were doing online stuff while, you know, while our school figured out, you know, all their, their COVID protocols kind of like, you know, see what we're dealing with. Cause you know, everything was very scary and unknown at, at this point. And, um, you know, like I've been asked like, Oh, like, did you know that like COVID was going to be what it became? And I'm, and I'm saying, no, like no one knew that was like, that was the whole, that was the whole reason this was such a big deal was because like no one knew what to expect and, um, and what it would become. So I think that definitely made it scary. Um, for really everyone, when you're hearing like attending physicians who you work with, who are like scared or, you know, about what this could be, it's, it's definitely, um, uh, uh, it, it was a sombering moment. Um, but ultimately they, they got us back into, into the hospital, um, by really the end of May, um, just with, you know, some new protocols, precautions, and it's been pretty much smooth sailing, ever since um just like business as usual and i would say the hospitals at least you know the ones i've worked in feel like a pretty safe place to be from a covid standpoint um there's like very little kind of um like hospital acquired covid cases you know like i had there's been no students or anything like that getting getting sick 
um, which is great, which is good. That, that's exactly what you want. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had at this point now, I did, you know, I've rotated through the ICU, for example, and, you know, seen firsthand, like the sickest of the sick from, you know, the pandemic and everything. And it's, um, also a scary place. I mean, arguably the scariest place to be. Um, I mean, the ICU is already a very poor prognostic environment to be in, but, um, you know, when it's filled up with, primarily acute respiratory failure due to COVID um, and everyone's on a ventilator and um, you know, it's just, it just sucks because there's not, you know, we have some treatments, you know, we do, we do, we do feel comfortable like, you know, with the, with treating things at this point, you know um, but at the same time, a lot of it is just doing what we can to support these patients and just being patient. And seeing, you know, if they improve or not, which is, you know, it's, you, you, you do feel a little helpless, um, at points, which, which is tough. Um, so it's, it, it was a real eye opening experience for me getting to see that firsthand. Um, and definitely just kind of made me appreciate, you know, everything I've, I've gotten the precautions we're taking and made me kind of feel good that we're doing the right stuff at home so that, you know, we, me and my family and, you know, we don't end up like this and don't, don't do anything dumb. <laughs> yeah, I can I can't even imagine what what, you know, walking in the door of what you do every day must must be. So first, thank you for for doing that in these crazy times and uh yeah, I, I just can't even imagine. Um can I ask about the vaccine? Yeah, I don't know much about it, but you can ask. So not not about the vaccine itself, but um we're we're seeing and hearing a lot of um hesitation from medical professionals on social media, which I think is silly. Um, but um, are you are you and your colleagues seeing that firsthand or is everyone, you know, sign me up whenever I can get it, I'm in? Yeah. I mean, most of the people I've interacted with is everyone's just signing up who can sign up. Um, but at the same time, there, there are a couple people that I was surprised um, who didn't get it. And I'm not really sure... I mean, no one has, it's, it's, this is just like, it's a silly thing. Cause it just reminds me of like people arguing against the flu vaccine or something. Like there's people who are very adamant. Like I don't, I don't get the flu vaccine. Like I get sick or I mean, it's, it's the same thing. Like it's the reasons people aren't getting the vaccine is the same. There's no base. There's no foundation in their arguments. It's just, it's just another vaccine. I think people forget that they've gotten like a dozen or more vaccines in their lifetime already. And they're doing just um, sort of like required to required (laughs) to be in school or to be, you know, places of work and things like that. So, yeah. uh, So, I mean, I haven't had too much direct exposure to people who don't get it. And, you know, I I don't think there's, there's no, in in what, in my experience and what I've read and learned and heard from, you know, other people I trust is there, there, there's no, real reason there's no true reason not to get this vaccine so that's where i stand good good to hear um switching gears back to uh back over to running for a bit um let's fast forward uh five or ten years um what are you going to be really proud of oh man as far as the running goes i mean i'm going to be really proud of having been able to kind of pursue this sport at this level for as long as i have um I think it's been really special. I think everyone, you, you see it a lot in our sport, like people want to keep running and see how good they can be. And, you know, they'll put their lives on hold and that's, that's an, a totally valiant thing to, to do. Um, Cause again, it's just prior prioritization things. And um, for me, I think I'm, I'm going to be most proud of though, being able to pursue being like, I'm going to be most proud that I was able to run and also not put my my dreams of being a doctor on, on hold. Um, you know, like that is a really long process. And if it was, if I was going into anything else, if I wanted to be like anything else, maybe I would have just run for longer um, and and went that route. But, you know, I didn't, it takes a long time to become a doctor. And I really didn't want to delay that any more than I had to. Um, and with that in mind, like, I was like, well, I would love to keep running. This is something I love to do. So I guess I'll just see if I can do it. So I think what I'm going to be most proud of in five or 10 years is the fact that even if I didn't run another step from today, that I was able to 
to run at the highest level and still do some pretty awesome things that I will always be, be, be proud of. That's super cool. And I think it's, it's becoming more common anyways. Um, I mean, maybe more so in 2020, but I think it's a, it's a trend going forward that professional athletes aren't just pro athletes, they're coaches, they're employees, they're, um, you know, they're doing more than just running and eating and sleeping and recovering. And I think that, um, I think that's helpful. Um, correct me if, if, if you disagree, but (laughs) I don't, you know, from everything you've said, it sounds like, you know, we're on the same page there, but, um, the idea is that like, you know, let's say you get injured, your whole world isn't in one arena. And, and like, if you don't have running, you still have more that, you know, you're, you're contributing and and can focus on. Yeah. I, I mean, I could go on for a while on this subject, but I, I totally agree on all points. Um, like I did just run for a year after college. Um, and it was fun. I really enjoyed my time in Arizona just training, but um, ultimately I did feel like, man, like this whole running thing, like there's, there's so much more time in the day to do something um, and be, you know, and achieve other things. And that's ultimately why I started medical school. I was, you know, I didn't, there's just, I think because it kind of goes along with being a happy person and be and feeling fulfilled and, you know, like, like you're doing everything you want to be doing. And I think, there's a lot to be gained from being busy, but busy because you're doing things you want to be doing. You're working, you're, 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 you have a family, you're, you know, you're raising kids, whatever. Like if you're happy, you're, you're running can only benefit from that. Um, so I think it kind of goes hand in hand that being busy and having other things going on in your life, there are great distractions for one another. Um, it provides that balance kind of like you were saying, not all your eggs are in one basket. Um, and yeah, and when things go wrong in one, the others are kind of like pillars to kind of support you and give you a place to to hang out, and, you know, while you're recovering on one end. So it's um yeah, I definitely believe that being you know pursuing all your interests outside of running is just as important for be for being a good runner. Very cool. Um, I think a lot of people that listen to this podcast are parents. Um, so what would what would you tell them? Um, in terms of a recommendation, your sort of top, top suggestions for, for being consistent as a runner, but also being there for your kids and, and your spouse? Yeah. So I would say, um, number one, having a treadmill is very, very helpful. Um, because then, you know, I have a treadmill in the, in the basement, which is also kind of like a playroom. Um, my, my one daughter has, has a little trampoline down there. So like, you know, if, if push comes to shove, I'm like, you know, I, I'm watching McKenna, like we can just go downstairs in the basement and she loves bouncing on her trampoline while I go for a 30 minute jog on the treadmill. So when we play songs and, uh, and, you know, I sing all the children's songs for 30 minutes and it's like, makes the run a lot harder, but, um, you know, it's fun, you know, it's fun. I get, we get to hang out. She's getting like exercise. It's like really like a best of all worlds kind of scenario there. So I think having a treadmill and then not having to leave the house, if you still want to get your training in or, you know, kind of multitask a little bit, um, that's been super helpful. I think it's tough because like sleep is always like a sensitive subject with parents. Um, but I'm able, you know, we're in a place now where like, you know, the kids sleep for the most part, but my wife will wake up and, um, you know, I, I always get an early start. I try to beat everyone awake and get and I'm running and you know I considered it a successful morning if I was you know home by 7 a.m from a 10 mile run and everyone was still asleep it it didn't always happen I mean more often than not it didn't happen but they were usually only up for like 30 minutes or less so it's you know that definitely helps um especially if I have coffee waiting for my wife when she makes it downstairs that's always the you know that's like hero status yeah yeah that's that's one of my moves um so yeah, I think there's just a lot of little places to um like make make the training easier when you have kids. Um and and then like when I and I really like I it's the whole COVID quarantine time has been obviously very different. Um for us it's actually, you know, my wife's been home, she hasn't been to work in almost 6 months. Um 
which has made things, you know, like she's always home. We, I mean, I'm home a lot. So it's been actually really nice and great having the whole family home um, more often than not. But um, in like non, you know, in when we eventually get past this phase, um, I was a big proponent of like stopping and getting my sec. If I needed to go do a workout or get like a second run in, um, I would just do it before I even came home. Um, I would do it like right from the hospital. You usually pop over to our our um, our school's gym, run for thirty minutes, do do some core. You know, obviously you have to prepare. You got to pack pack everything ahead of time. Blah blah blah. Um, but that way, when I got home, like that was it. There was no. It was like family time from you know five or six p.m. through the rest of the night. Um, and that's you know that was also really important for me. I didn't want to have to like get home, say hi to everyone, and then leave again. That's like always a bummer. Um, and then, you know, and then it's just reading books and doing, I mean, being a parent, you know, that's, it's a fun job. So, uh, you just do all, all the fun things and whatever your, your kids demanding you to do that day. <laughs> I love it. Um, so i I asked the same question to Mike Wardian who, uh, has a couple of kids and now a couple of dogs and a wife mm-hmm. and his, his feedback was pretty much the same, like make your training as invisible as possible so that. Um, I think your your tip there of um, do your run before you come home versus come home and then do it and then come back home. I think, you know, you're saving m- many minutes there and the stress of going in and out. And um, I think it's a very intelligent way to do things. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, you save a lot of time. I'm all about efficiency as well. Like that time you waste, like getting home, you hang out, say hi for 30 minutes, you get, get dressed, blah, blah, blah. But when you have it all, like you're doing it from work, like there's nowhere else to go. You just go and do it and you, you end up saving a lot of time, um, which is huge. For sure. Um, I think my last question is, uh, what do you know now about running that you wish you knew when you started? Maybe not, you know, when you were in fourth or fifth grade, but um, high school or collegiately. Um, I would say the most important thing I've learned now that I wish I knew um, pretty early on in my career was not to take like not to take race day so seriously um, and I mean that from the standpoint of like when you're in college like every you know all, like every race is kind of a big race like let's be honest and 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 it's built up as such in your head um, and like that's why like I, sh- I struggled a lot I did terrible in my in I guess I, you can argue a majority or at least half of like any big um like ncaa cha- championship r- r- races i ran in, in cross or on the, the uh, track um and it, it took me until like my senior year to really figure it out um and not psych myself out and just realize that you know race day r- like you know when you're on the start line like the work is already done um like there's no or, or even like the 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 like even a whole seven days out from a big race, like the work is done like that. And just thinking about all that training you've done for the last X amount of months, like that's, that was the race. Like you are like the hard part is done. Um, right. And and I think that's the mentality. Oh, I have a hard time explaining it, but just realizing that and taking comfort in that and knowing like, Oh, well, like all I have to do is just go see what the lot, what I, you know, put out there what I did for the last three months. Like there's no like heroic effort I need to do today um, because it's been done. Um, So I think that just takes a huge psychological load off your shoulders when you're like, when I show up for a race now, like I don't get nearly as nervous as I used to um, because it's just another day. And and I try to embrace more like, this is the fun part. This is what I, this is why I do it is to, to show up on race day. Um, And I think that's uh, something that, it's hard. It's easy to get to, to get away from. So. Yeah, I think it's a good reminder. Um, so appreciate that. And, uh, thanks for taking some time to chat today. Oh, it's been, it's been a pleasure. I, I, this has been a lot of fun. You made me really ask some, some really good questions that really made me think about things I haven't thought about in a long time. So thank you. Appreciate it. And, uh, we'll see you out there and, uh, excited to follow along in, uh, in the rest of 2021. Thank you. That's it for today's episode. Like many long runs, it's sad when it has to end. I hope you join in next week on For the Long Run. And in the meantime, happy trails. If you've enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot to me if you shared it so that others can find it and enjoy it too.